that uh, Mr. Miller, who was a great friend of my grandfather's actually in Chattanooga, gave all of his money to you. Um, <laughs> not some. Uh, I don't know what it was. Um, you know, in Tennessee, we call, refer to UVA as the Sewanee of the Mid-Atlantic. And that might have been part of the bitterness on his part. I'm not sure. But um, I'm always delighted to be here. And I thank you for my wife, who is largely well-educated. Um, she started her life in Mississippi, so you had a lot of work to do. Is this being taped? Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. We'll move on. Of course, Tennessee is just Mississippi with hardback books, so, so we do what we can. I'm, I am honored to be here to talk about very important things, uh, particularly in the shadow of, of Monticello and, and Madison's home. I spent uh, the fall with your two local heroes in, in many ways, uh, Jefferson and Madison, who were remarkably good on religious liberty, remarkably pioneering, and drew from, did the best that any of us can do in life, I think. They drew on their personal experience and their personal reason to make the world different. They were born into a world that was one way, and they died in a world that was another. And the one they died in is the one we have to protect and preserve, and that's what we're here to talk about. We are unquestionably living in a time of great political division. I know this personally uh, from my day job at Newsweek. I first got a personal glimpse of this uh, when I did a story on Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ a few years ago in which I was rather um, fair but tough on uh, Mr. Gibson and the movie and came in, this is before Blackberries and that sort of thing, came in to uh, get my email on the first day of the week. That sounds nice and biblical, doesn't it? Um, not quite as momentous as the other first day of the week. Uh, and opened up a note from a southern evangelical that simply said, Dear Mr. Meacham, I'm praying for you, but I hope you go to hell. So, <laughs> so I answered it, of course, uh, stupidly, and said, well, that shows a certain doubt in the efficacy of prayer. And <laughs> if your news week was late the next week, it was because I, <laughs> I apologize to you on behalf of the Washington Post Company for that. Uh, I found... I am an Episcopalian. I am a believer. I believe in what Robert Louis Stevenson is said to have said, that the duty of a Christian is not to succeed but to fail cheerfully. I, I do that very well. Uh, Cardinal Newman, who is a particularly painful pig, uh, figure for Anglicans because we have to call him Cardinal Newman uh, since it didn't work out too well with the Church of England in, in the end, said that the test of our faith is to be able to fail without disappointment. And I think that's, that's largely true. In New York, where I live and move and have my being, so to speak, uh, most of the time, I do find that there is a kind of cultural divide between the world I came from in Chattanooga and Sewanee and, and Tennessee. It's not as wide, I think, as the people on Fox News would have you think. It's not as uh, deep as that, but it's there. There is, there is a secular and religious divide in this country. I think both sides are to blame for it. I think that we are beginning to see it in the polls. Uh, Gallup, since 2001, has been asking whether people believe that organized religion has too much influence in public life in America. And last year, it hit the highest ever, 33%. So a third of the country thinks that organized religion is too influential. Same time, 80% of the country is Christian, 90% is believing, 78% believe in the virgin birth, 82% uh, believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. So this is a, an intensely religious country, uh, but it is also a diverse one, a pluralistic one, and one marked by religious liberty, largely because of what the men who live not far from here did. And I think that's something we have to protect well, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about. 